very good. So again, um, what I'm going to do is just very briefly go through some of the basics of distributed temperature sensing under the assumption that you all did your homework and you watched the um, roughly two hours of videos that we provided to you. I'm chuckling. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I know you right. didn't do that, but I hope you watched the first one. How's that? Um, so if you didn't, uh, that's fine. Don't worry. We have a half hour for questions. Uh, in fact, even probably a little bit more time um, after we go through some of these basics and ideas. So think of your questions. Don't hesitate. If you didn't, if you're not comfortable um, understanding something we're talking about, just ask us. This is a very informal uh, workshop, and so the idea is to make sure you're up to speed, and you've got we've got all day to go through this. So, all right. So I think you can see my screen. I'm just checking. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure we do. Okay. Good. Because I don't I don't have the Zoom link up on my computer, so I have to look across the table. All right. So basically, what is an optical fiber? Okay. Optical fiber is is a uh, is, a, a, is glass and it allows uh, light to pass uh, through it with very little light loss. And as a result, that's why we use fiber optic uh, cables for data transmission. We can send pulses of light and code our, our data, our voice, et cetera, uh, and send it out in optical fiber great distances. And at the end of that fiber, uh, the signal is still strong. And typical optical fiber has uh, uh, this slide shows, let me just see if we can use my pointer. Hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, typically has uh, uh, two kinds of glass in the center, and then we just have some uh, plastic coating over the outside. The center we call the core. That's where most of the photons are, are transmitted and, and travel down the optical fiber. Around that, uh, and basically fused to it, it's made as a, a continuous uh, uh, fiber with two sets of glasses. The, uh, the outer glass we call the cladding glass, and that ranges in, uh, in diameter from uh, uh, roughly 100 microns down to about 50 microns, depending on the kind of fiber we're going to be using. And then again, over the top of that, some kind of plastic um, to keep uh, water and hydrogen from going into the glass and weathering the glass. Then on top of that, we're going to add all kinds of other things, strength elements, uh, uh, protection from pressure, protection from strain, things like that. But the actual fiber itself um, is uh, is, is just glass. And we call, um, optical fibers are often called light pipes because they actually appear to pipe the photons directly down the, the uh, center part of the glass with a little bit of interaction out into the cladding and again, can go great distances. So with distributed temperature sensing, we use Raman backscatter. So we're firing a pulse of laser light uh, into our optical fiber. And then we are looking at the scattering of those photons, the interactions, scattering is an interaction between a photon and, uh, and the molecular structure or the atomic structure um, of the glass material itself. Typical scattering is elastic scattering, uh, which means if I shine the laser light onto a wall uh, in your office right now, you would mostly be seeing uh, elastic scattering. That's a Rayleigh scattering. We get the Basically, it's, think of it as a reflection. The photon is absorbed and, uh, by the surface, and then that photon is popped back out at the same wavelength and at the same frequency. So you see the same thing. It's a reflection, same colors uh, as, as the light coming in. Uh, Raman backscatter uh, produces this an inelastic scattering. The photon is absorbed by the, by the molecule, the, the glass, uh, or anything else in the glass, and then is re-emitted. But instead of being re-emitted at the same wavelength, um, it is re-emitted at one of two different wavelengths, either greater, longer wavelength, we call that the Stokes scattering or a redshift, or uh, re returned at a higher frequency, a shorter wavelength, and a blue shift, and that's the anti-Stokes photons, okay? Those come back. Um, and let's, a quick schematic of kind of what goes on. Rayleigh scattering, think about um, on this glass molecule or germanium oxide, whatever, uh, and I'm sitting there, I'm silicon dioxide, and I absorb a photon. Sorry, I got to use my other mouse here. I have to move around. There we go. Um, I absorb that photon. Oof, I bring it up to some energy level, uh, the molecule, and then the molecule says, the heck with this. I don't want this photon anymore, and kicks it back out. I'm not a physicist, by the way, as you can tell. I just like to tell stories about photons, and out they come, the same, same way. With Raman backscatter, it's a little bit different. So here, again, I apologize for this. I'm trying to drive a mouse at a screen six feet away. Um, we absorb uh, that 
photon up to this level, the same energy level. And then it's, when I kick it back out, it comes back. Uh, I leave a little bit of energy behind in the, uh, in the molecule. So essentially that photon heated the glass up a little bit, very small amount, tiny amount. Um, and that comes back then at a different uh, wavelength, redshifted, short, a longer wavelength. On the opposite, on the other side of that is our anti-Stokes, where now if the molecular state, if as I warm up the glass, the molecular state is a little higher, okay, I absorb that photon. Uh, and instead of uh, bringing that photon back at the same wavelength, I actually take a little bit of energy out of the silicon dioxide molecule, and I return the photon at a shorter wavelength, blue shifted with a little bit more energy. So that's the inelastic part, meaning it's not, a, uh, it's not like a, a, a perfect exchange of energy. I either take energy or I leave some energy behind. And what we're gonna be interested in is measuring these Stokes and anti-Stokes uh, photons coming back to our detector, because just from this image over here, there we go you can see that the warmer the glass is, the hotter it is, the higher the energy level of the glass that's out there, um, I'm gonna have the potential to produce more of these anti-Stokes photons um, as it warms up. So essentially, the number of anti-Stokes photons I get back is a function of the temperature of the scattering site, okay? And here's just a schematic of those wavelengths uh, and, 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 and the amplitude Okay, here's our incident light. This is the laser light that we pulse down uh, for a DTS, and that's typically in the near infrared. So let's say a thousand nanometers or uh, uh, 1300 nanometers, which is a common, roughly common wavelength also for, for data communication on optical fibers. And my, I'm sorry, my cursor just keeps losing it. So. Yeah, I don't know where it is. There it is, it comes back. All right, I'll keep it moving. Um, we have a couple of other kinds of scattering that are inelastic, Brion scattering. Let's not talk about those today. Um, they, they are good for strain measurements. But then here's our Raman uh, Stokes uh, photons coming back. Again, far less energy coming back than the Rayleigh scattering. I don't get many of these photons back. That's quite an um, uncommon interaction. And then also on shorter wavelengths, I get my anti-Stokes or Raman backscatter. And what we're gonna be comparing in the DTS is the amplitude of these anti-Stokes photons, which are mostly a function of temperature of the glass to our Stokes photons, which are far less a function of the temperature of the glass, the number of those that come back. Okay, um, so as I send this light down, I have the scattering, okay? I'm losing light. I'm bouncing light back off, off these interactions. And the equations or the law that, that uh, we look at that tells us how much scattering is occurring as a function of distance is Beer's law. And that's the, so I shoot down some light at intensity um, I zero. So this is call it a hundred photons, if you will. And as I go down the optical fiber, I will slowly lose those photons to scattering. So at the end of the fiber, I might only see 90 photons, the remaining 10 photons have been backscattered, have been scattered someplace, okay? And the important uh, factor then in that that we're gonna be talking about later, later is the attenuation coefficient. How much attenuation is there, okay? So you can just think about this um, as, uh, for those of us hydrologists, think of attenuation as like the turbidity of, the, of a water column of a lake, okay? If the lake is very uh, clear, my uh, uh, attenuation coefficient of light in the lake is quite small. And as a result, I can see quite deep into the lake. I can see the bottom of the lake. If the lake's turbid, uh, there's scattering that's going on. It's the same physics and uh, uh, the light goes far less, okay? And in our terms in, in distributed temperature sensing, this attenuation factor, we call it the attenuation coefficient. Um, it is in units of inverse meters, but we also use, often use the term decibels per kilometer. So it's a, it's a loss coefficient, how much light is lost. And this is an important component uh, for how, we, how far we can measure distributed temperature sensing. Okay, so here's a, just a quick graph of, um, there we go, my, yeah, my cursor keeps going away, of Stokes amplitude coming back from, a, uh, from an optical fiber as a function of distance. Again, um, at the end of the fiber at 600 meters, I'm getting less photons coming back 
uh, less Stokes photons coming back because they some of them have been scattered on the way to 600 meters, not very many. On the other hand, if I have a lot of attenuation, if the fiber is dark or there's lots of scattering sites or the fiber is bent or a variety of things, then I lose light very quickly and I don't see, I don't get any photons back from the end of the fiber. And this is important for how far we can measure temperature on an optical fiber and then also our resolution. How many photons will we get back to tell us what the temperature is? In the case up here on the top, we're going to get a lot of photons back. Our temperature resolution, the ability to measure temperature and resolve differences, is going to be quite high. But if the fiber is really scattery or lossy, we say, we're not going to get a lot of light back and our temperatures that we measure or that we calculate are going to be quite uncertain because I only got a few photons back. Okay. Okay. Now, the key for us, and this comes in when we, as we start going through the equations of distributed temperature sensing, is the difference in attenuation between our two different wavelengths or frequencies coming back. Okay. Because um, scattering is a function of wavelength, and this is if anybody's a scuba diver in this group, you would know this, that as you go deeper into the ocean, um, quite a bit of uh, certain wavelengths are filtered out. The colors change that you see. Why? Because um, some of the shorter wavelengths are filtered out and we only get longer wavelengths coming through or attenuated. So same with distributed temperature sensing. I send a pulse of light down. On the way back, these Stokes and anti-Stokes uh, photons are coming back. They will be attenuated as well. They have attenuation, but they're going to be attenuated differently, the two of them differently. So um, that's important because we have to be able to differentiate this difference in attenuation versus the difference in Stokes and anti-Stokes. Okay? And the attenuation can also change along the fiber. We'll go into that in just a minute. Um, but here's just a simple graph to show you what's going on. Again, what we're going to be measuring in, with our distributed temperature sensing system is the number of photons coming back. And let's call this, uh, here's our Stokes in, in red. That's the red shifted photons. And I'm going to ratio that to the blue shifted photons, the anti-Stokes photons. So it's the ratio of these two amplitudes that tells me the temperature. And because of differential attenuation, I think you can see it in this graph, you know, the ratio between the blue and the red here at distance, uh, would that be 50 meters, is quite different than what that ratio would look like out at 1,000 meters, okay? I've attenuated the anti-Stokes frequencies, the anti-Stokes photons more. They're shorter wavelengths, so they're gonna be attenuated a little more. But this is for a piece of glass that is at the same temperature for 1,000 meters, okay? So we have to be able to account for this difference in attenuation. We have to either measure it in some way uh, or be able to calibrate it out, okay? So that's gonna be, that's an important thing. You'll, you'll hear us talk a lot about this as we talk about DTS actually calcul calculating temperatures. So it's early in the morning. We have to throw at least a couple of equations up. Um, I'll go through these very quickly, but these are the, this is the calculated, this is the equations we use to tell us how many photons are gonna come back to our detector as a function of way over here in the bottom, temperature. That's the key factor, okay? Uh, we have a lot of things that go on. We have some, some issues, uh, impacts of wavelength. Here's our attenuation coefficients. This is for the Rayleigh backscatter, and this is for the Stokes backscatter. The anti-Stokes intensity looks similar. Once again, same kind of coefficients. Our anti-Stokes uh, um, attenuation factor is lying in here. And also, the more important thing is temperature. So this is how we relate intensity to temperature. Okay. And I've, simplifi I've simplified this equation for this morning, so sorry. Um, when we're all done, when we simplify even more, we end up with a, a, an equation that looks like this. This is our equation to calculate temperature from Stokes and anti-Stokes intensity for a cable that has a constant, uniform, I should say, uh, uh, differential attenuation coefficient. Okay, we'll go into the, uh, when it's not the same uh, in a little bit, but it's just basically our temperature as a function of distance, Z down the fiber, and a function of the ratio of our two intensities of the photons coming back is a function of the log of the intensity ratio. The differential attenuation is a function of times distance down the fiber, some coefficients, and then uh, up on the top, some additional coefficients that look at uh, uh, Boltzmann constants and the change in frequency that we expect to see for the Stokes and anti-Stokes, okay? From this equation, just basically, um, 
we now have one equation with one input, our, our independent variable. This is our dependent variable temperature. And we have at least three other terms in this equation that either we could, we can calculate to some degree, or we can uh, use these as curve fitting parameters to relate uh, our stoke to, to calculate them down the fiber. And in fact, that's typically what we're gonna do is we're going to measure the Stokes and anti-Stokes intensity and measure the temperature at let's say three different places along the optical fiber with some kind of other in independent sensor. And then we can curve fit or, or estimate the three other parameters. Um, if you only have two independent temperatures, we can assume one of them is constants. Uh, typically the term on the top, which we call omega, uh, is a, should be a constant, okay? So that's kind of the basics of the equations that we're gonna use. And then I just wanted to show you quickly one, you've seen this in the, in the videos, this is uh, a plot of Stokes and anti-Stokes intensity as a function of distance down a typical optical fiber in the field. This happens to be out in a partially snow covered environment. And uh, I just wanted to point out what you can see here again, we're taking the ratio of the anti-Stokes to the Stokes at each distance down the fiber to get us temperature. Here you can see very little differential attenuation, right? The ratio here between these two looks pretty similar to the ratio here at shorter distances. Okay, that's because this was a fiber that was quite transparent, very little scattering, uh, very little differential attenuation going on. Had we run this cable out another, well, this is only 300 meters. Had we gone further, we would have seen that spread slowly occur. Okay, and the peaks here uh, in this graph represent areas where the optical fiber was actually um, it, uh, out in the bright sun. And you can see that the anti-Stokes, number of anti-Stokes photons coming back is much greater in those areas. The fiber itself was warmed by the sun, okay, in a couple of different places. You can also see there is some effect of temperature on the Stokes frequencies, the Stokes photons coming back, but it's far less, okay? All right, so just that was a really quick summary of the details. You, again, go back to the videos or start asking us questions. John's gonna talk in just a minute on some other details of optical fibers, but here's how this thing works, just in very much schematic. We have a box which fires a laser pulse, a very short pulse of laser that determines actually the spatial resolution, spatial sampling of our instrument. We send the pulse down and we look then at the backscattered light in the two frequencies of interest and we detect those and calculate them, okay? So it really is a fairly simple uh, system or it looks fairly simple. It is essentially LIDAR, if any of you have worked with LIDAR, it is basically a LIDAR-like measurement, but instead of measuring the elastic scattering, the Rayleigh scattering, we're measuring the inelastic scattering. So it's a Raman LIDAR. Okay, and if you have worked with LIDAR, um, you know, typically we use it to just measure topographic elevation, the distance to some point. Okay, so that we look for the big, the big, big hard backscatter that we get when the photons finally hit something hard. But if you've worked with LIDAR in the, in the environment, you know that we can also measure uh, uh, canopies, we can measure within the trees by looking at backscatter of uh, photons as, the, as they're hitting the, the, looking down as they're hitting the leaves and things like that. We see less coming back, but we can calculate um, the time of flight of those as well. So we can get sort of a surface and that's our uh, internal structure. And it's the same thing we do with, with DTS is we're measuring the time of flight of these photons. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, maybe take any questions. Real quick ones.